good evening. I'm Terrible Troll. Tonight we have a very special reading for you. A time for trolls. Fairy tales from Norway. Told by Esbjornsson and Moe. Translated by Joan Roll Hansen. Please don't forget to wrap up on the like button, subscribe if you wish, and leave your comments below. Without further ado, let's move into tonight's read. Askeladd and the Silver Ducks There was once a poor man who had three sons. When he died, the two eldest sons went out into the world to seek their fortune, but they would not let the youngest son go with them. We know what you're fit for, they said. All you do is squat by the fire, fiddling with the ashes. Well, I'll go alone then, said Askeladd. The two eldest brothers walked off and made their way to the king's farm. There they entered into service, one under the stable groom and one under the gardener. Askeladd started out too, and took with him a big kneading trough, the only thing their parents had left them. The other brothers had not cared about it, and it was too heavy to carry, but he did not like to leave it behind. After walking a while, he also came to the king's farm and asked for service. They told him they did not need him. Still, he kept on asking so politely that in the end he was allowed to help in the kitchen and carry wood and water for the cook. He was quick and willing to work, and soon he was well liked by everyone there. But the other two brothers were lazy and got blows by the dozen and little wages. And they grew envious of Askeladd when they saw him doing so well. Opposite the king's farm, on the other side of a big lake, there lived a troll who had seven silver ducks. These ducks basked and swam on the lake, and they could be seen from the king's farm. The king had often wished they were his, and one day the two eldest brothers said to the groom, If our brother liked, he could easily get the seven silver ducks for the king. He has said so. And you can be sure the groom lost no time in passing this on to the king. Then the king called in Askeladd and said to him, Your brothers tell me you're willing to get me those silver ducks. Go and get them now. I've never thought of such a thing, said the lad. But the king was not to be put off. You've said you'll do it, he said, and I'm going to take you at your word, my lad. Well, said the lad, if there's no way out of it, please let me have a quarter of rye and a quarter of wheat, and I'll try and get them. He was given the rye and the wheat, and he stored it in the kneading trough he had brought from home. And in this he rode across the lake. After he reached the other side, he walked along the shore, scattering the grain. At last he was able to lure the ducks inside his trough, and then he rode back as fast as he could. When he got to the middle of the lake, the troll came out and saw him. Have you made off with my seven silver ducks? He shouted. I have, said the lad. Will you be coming again? asked the troll. I might, said the lad. When he came back to the king with the seven silver ducks, he became even more popular in the household, and the king himself gave him praise. But his brothers grew more sullen and jealous, and they decided to tell the groom that Askeladd had said he could get the king the troll's quilt with all the checks of silver and gold at any time at all, and the groom wasted no time in telling the king this news. Then the king spoke to the lad, and told him he knew from his brothers that he had boasted of being able to get hold of the troll's quilt with the silver and gold checks. Now he was to do so, or pay with his life. Askeladd replied that he had never said any such thing, but it was no use, and so he asked for three days to find a plan. Three days later he rode across the lake again in his kneading trough, and walked about keeping careful watch. At last he caught sight of the hill folk, putting the quilt out to air it, and as soon as they disappeared inside the mountain, Askeladd seized the quilt and rode back as fast as he could. When he was out in the middle of the lake, the troll came along and saw him. Did you steal my seven silver ducks? shouted the troll. Yes, I did, said the lad. And have you stolen my quilt with all the checks of silver and gold? I have, said the lad. Will you be coming here again? I might, said the lad. When he returned with the gold and silver quilt, he became even more popular, and he was made the king's personal servant. This made the other brothers much more vexed, and in revenge they agreed to say to the groom, Our brother has told us that he can get the king the troll's golden harp. This harp makes everyone glad when they hear it, no matter how sad they are. And the groom went straight to the king 
and told him the news, and the king said to the lad, I'm going to take you at your word again. If you get me the harp, I'll give you my daughter and half of my kingdom. If you don't, you will pay with your life. I've never thought or said any such thing, replied Askeladd. But I suppose there's no choice, and I'd better try. Could you let me have six days to find a plan? The six days were granted, and when they were over, he had to set out. He took with him in his pocket a nail, a birch twig, and a candle end, and rode across the lake. Near the mountain, he started pacing quickly to and fro, and after a while, the troll came out and saw him. Didn't you steal my seven silver ducks? shouted the troll. And I did said the lad. And didn't you steal my quilt with the silver and gold checks as well? Yes, I did, said the lad. Then the troll seized him and carried him inside the mountain. Well, daughter, he said, now I've caught the boy who stole my silver ducks and my quilt with the checks of silver and gold. Fatten him up, and we can kill him and invite our friends to a feast. She set to work at once and put him in the fattening pen. And he was there for eight days and was given the best food and drink, as much as he wanted. After eight days had passed, the troll told his daughter to go and cut his little finger to find out whether he was fat enough. She went down to the fattening pen. Give me your little finger, she said. But Askeladd offered her the nail he had brought with him, and she cut that instead. Oh, he's still hard as nails, said the troll's daughter when she came in to her father. He's not ready yet. Eight days later, the same thing happened, only this time Askeladd held out the birch twig. He's a bit better, she said when she came back to her father, but he's still tough as wood. But after eight days more, the troll told his daughter to go out again and see whether he was fat enough yet. Give me your little finger, said the troll's daughter to Askeladd in the fattening pen. And this time he let her have the candle end. I think he's fat enough now, she said. How is he? said the troll. I'll be off then, and invite our guests. In the meantime, you can kill him and roast one half of him, and boil the other. After the troll had gone, the daughter began to sharpen a long, long knife. Are you going to use that to slaughter me? asked the lad. Yes, my lad, said the troll's daughter. But the blade's not keen enough, said the lad. I can sharpen it for you, and then it will be all the easier for you to kill me and she gave him the knife, and he started to wet the blade. Let me try it on your hair, said the lad. It should be just right now, and she let him do so. But as he took her by the hair, he bent back her neck and cut off her head. Then he boiled half of her and roasted the other half and set the dish on the table, and he dressed himself in her clothes and sat down in a far corner. When the troll came home with his guests, he thought it was his daughter sitting there, and asked her to come and join them at their meal. No, answered the lad. I don't want anything to eat. I feel out of sorts. Well, you know how to raise your spirits, said the troll. Play upon our golden harp. Oh, yes. Where is it again? asked Askeladd. You know well enough. You had it last. It's hanging up there over the door said the troll. Askeladd did not need to be told twice. He took down the harp and wandered in and out playing upon it. But all of a sudden he pushed his kneading trough out on the lake and rode off so fast that the water swirled about him. After a while the troll thought his daughter had been away a long time, and when he went out to see what was the matter he caught sight of the lad in his trough far out in the middle of the lake. Aren't you the one who stole my seven silver ducks? shouted the troll. Yes, said Askeladd. And didn't you steal my quilt with the silver and gold checks as well? Yes, said Askeladd. Have you just taken my golden harp? cried the troll. Yes, I have, said the lad. Haven't I eaten you up then? No, you've eaten your daughter, answered the lad. And when the troll heard this, he became so angry that he burst. So then Askeladd rode back to the mountain and carried away a heap of gold and silver, as much as he could store in his trough. After he returned to the king's farm with the golden harp, he wedded the princess and got half of the kingdom, just as the king had promised. But he was good to his brothers, for he believed that they had only meant well when they spoke of him in the household.
The Three Billigan Whiskers. Once upon a time, there were three billy goats who were on their way to the mountain grass to get fat, and each of them was called Billigan Whiskers. As they walked along, they had to cross a bridge over a waterfall, and under the bridge there lived a big, horrid troll with eyes like pewter plates and a nose as long as a rake handle. First, the youngest Billiken Whiskers came to cross the bridge. Trip, 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 went the bridge. Who's that tripping over my bridge? roared the troll. Oh, I'm the smallest Billiken Whiskers, and I'm on my way to the mountain grass to get fat, said the billy goat in a tiny, tiny voice. Now I'm coming to eat you up, said the troll. Oh no, don't eat me up, I'm so small. Wait a while till the second Billiken Whiskers comes, he's much bigger. Very well, said the troll, and a little while later the second Billiken Whiskers came to cross the bridge. Trot, 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 went the bridge. Who's that trotting over my bridge? roared the troll. Oh, I'm the second Billiken Whiskers, on my way to the mountain grass to get fat, said the billy goat in a clear, clear voice. Now I'm coming to eat you up, said the troll. Oh no, don't eat me up, wait a while, till the big Billiken Whiskers comes, he's much, much bigger. Very well then, said the troll, and all of a sudden the big Billiken Whiskers came along. Tramp, 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 went the bridge. He was so heavy that the bridge creaked and groaned under him. Who's that tramping over my bridge? roared the troll. I'm the big Billiken Whiskers, said the billy goat in a deep, deep voice. Now I'm coming to eat you up, roared the troll. Up you come, I have two spears, with them I'll tear your eyes and ears. I have two mighty boulder stones, with them I'll crush your marrow and bones, said the billy goat. And he charged at the troll and stuck out his eyes and battered his marrow and bones and butted him over the edge of the waterfall. And then he went up to the mountain grass. There the billy goats got so fat, so very, very fat, that they could hardly walk home again. And as far as I know, they're still as fat as that. The Man Who Kept House there once was a cross and peevish man who had the idea that his wife never did enough in the house. One evening he came home from the haymaking, swearing and grumbling like a bear with a sore head. Oh, my dear, don't scold so, said his wife. Tomorrow we'll change jobs. I'll go out with the haymakers and you can do the housework. The man liked this plan well enough and he said he was willing. Early the next morning the wife shouldered the scythe and went out into the meadow to cut hay, and the man set about working in the house. First he thought he would churn butter, but after churning a while he felt thirsty and went down to the cellar to tap ale. While he was tapping an ale into a bowl, he heard a pig wander into the house. He darted up the cellar steps with the tap in hand to get the pig before it could upset the churn. But when he found the churn knocked over and the pig gobbling up the cream now spilt all over the floor, he flew into such a rage that he clean forgot about the barrel of ale and made a bee line for the pig. He caught up with it in the doorway and gave it a stout kick, so that it never stirred again. Then it dawned on him that he still had the tap in his hand, but by the time he reached the cellar, the barrel was dry. He set out for the milk shed once more and found enough cream to fill the churn and kept on churning away, for he wanted to have butter ready for dinner. After he had been churning a while, he suddenly remembered that there was a cow at home in the stable still without a thing to eat or drink at this late hour. It seemed too far to take her to the field, and he thought he might as well put her to graze on the roof. There being a turf roof on the farmhouse with thick rich grass, the house was on a steep hillside, and he was sure he could get the cow up on the roof without mishap if he laid a plank across. But he did not dare let go of the churn either, for fear of it being upset by the baby who was crawling about on all fours. So he hoisted the churn on his back and went out to water the cow before he led her up to the roof. He seized a bucket to fetch water from the well, but when he bent over the side of the well to drop the water, the cream poured out of the churn and ran down his neck. It was getting on for dinner time, and he still had no butter, so he thought he had better make porridge and hung a pot of water over the hearth. Then it crossed his mind that the cow might fall off the roof and break her legs or her neck, and so he went up to tether her safely. He tied a loop around the cow's neck, slipped the rope down through the chimney, and tied the other end to his own leg for the water was already boiling in the pot, and he had to start mixing the porridge. While he was doing so, the cow did fall off the roof after all, and pulled the man up the chimney by the leg. There he got stuck, and the cow outside was in a fine pickle, dangling beside the wall, neither up nor down. The wife had been waiting hour after hour for the man to come and call her in to dinner, but time dragged on and nothing happened. 
At last she grew weary and started for home. As soon as she caught sight of the unhappy cow hanging there, she went up to it and cut the rope with a scythe. Then the man fell down the chimney, and when the wife came in he was standing on his head in the porridge pot. The Cock and the Hen in the Hazelwood once upon a time, the cock and the hen went into the hazel wood to pick nuts, and the hen got a nutshell stuck in her throat, and she lay there flapping her wings. The cock wanted to fetch water for her, and he ran off to the spring and said, Dear spring, give me water to give to Hickty, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. The spring answered, You'll get no water till you bring me leaves. And the cock ran off to the lime tree. Dear lime tree, give me leaves to give to the spring who will give me water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no leaves till you bring me ribbons of red gold, answered the lime tree. And the cock ran off to the Virgin Mary. Dear Virgin Mary, give me ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no ribbons of red gold till you bring me shoes, answered the Virgin Mary, and the cock ran off to the shoemaker. Dear shoemaker, give me shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no shoes till you bring me bristles, answered the shoemaker, and the cock ran off to the sow. Dear sow, give me bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me the water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no bristles till you bring me corn, answered the sow. And the cock ran off to the thresher. Dear thresher, give me the corn to give to the sow, who will give me the bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me the shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me the ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me the leaves to give to the spring, who will give me the water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no corn till you bring me a bannock, answered the thresher. And the cock ran off to the bakeress. Dear bakeress, give me a bannock to give to the thresher, who will give me the corn to give to the sow, who will give me the bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me the shoe to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me the ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me the leaves to give to the spring, who will give me the water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no bannock till you bring me wood, answered the bakeress. And the cock ran off to the woodcutter. Dear woodcutter, give me wood to give to the bakeress, who will give me a bannock to give to the thresher, who will give me corn to give to the sow, who will give me the bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me the ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me the water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no wood till you bring me an axe, answered the woodcutter. And the cock ran off to the smith. Dear smith, give me an axe to give to the woodcutter, who will give me wood to give to the bakeress, who will give me a bannock to give to the thresher, who will give me corn to give to the sow, who will give me bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. You'll get no axe till you bring me charcoal, answered the smith. And the cock ran off to the charcoal burner. Dear charcoal burner, give me charcoal to give to the smith, who will give me an axe to give to the woodcutter, who will give me wood to give to the bakeress, who will give me a bannock to give to the thresher, who will give me corn to give to the sow, who will give me bristles to give to the shoemaker, who will give me shoes to give to the Virgin Mary, who will give me ribbons of red gold to give to the lime tree, who will give me leaves to give to the spring, who will give me water to give to Hickety, my dear hen, who is fighting for her life in the hazel wood. And the charcoal burner felt sorry for the cock and gave him charcoal. And the smith got charcoal, and the woodcutter an axe, and the bakeress wood, and the thresher a bannock, and the sow corn, and the shoemaker bristles, and the Virgin Mary shoes, and the lime tree ribbons of red gold, and the spring leaves, and the cock water that he gave to Hickety, his dear hen who was fighting for her life in the hazel wood. And so it was, she got well again. east of the sun and west of the moon. Once upon a time there was a poor cotter who had many children and little to give them in the way of food or clothing. They were bonny children all, but the fairest was the youngest daughter. She was as fair as fair could be. One Thursday evening, late in the autumn, it was dark and stormy, and the wind and the rain made the walls creak, and the family sat huddled around the hearth, each busy with his own task. All of a sudden there came three knocks on the window pane. The cotter went out to see who it was, and outside the door he found a big, big white bear standing there. "'Good evening, cotter,' said the white bear. "'Good evening,' said the man. 
If you will give me your youngest daughter, I will make you as rich as you are now poor, said the bear. The carter thought it very fine indeed that he was to be so rich, but he felt he ought to speak with his daughter first, and he went in and told her that there was a big white bear outside who promised to make all of them very rich if he could only have her. She was unwilling, but the carter went outside again and settled with the bear that he should return on the following Thursday evening and receive an answer. In the meantime the family gave her no peace, and kept on describing all the riches that would be theirs and all the good things that she would have herself, and at last she gave in. She washed and mended her tattered clothes, and adorned herself as best she could. Soon she was ready to set out, for there was little enough she had to take with her. On the following Thursday evening the white bear came to fetch her. She sat upon his back with her bundle, and then off they went. After they had gone a long way, the white bear said, Are you afraid? No, she wasn't, she said. Hold on to my fur, and you will be quite safe, he said. She rode on much further, and at long last they came to a tall mountain. There the white bear knocked a gate open, and they entered a palace with many rooms, well lit and gleaming with gold and silver. And they came into a great hall where a table was laid ready, and you cannot imagine how rich and splendid it was. Then the white bear gave her a silver bell, and if there was anything she wanted she had only to ring the bell, and she would have it. When she had eaten and the evening drew on she felt sleepy after her journey, and thought she would like to go to bed. She rang the silver bell, and scarcely had she touched it when she found herself in a chamber where there stood a bed already as beautiful as you could wish to lie in, with silk covers and curtains and fringes of gold, and everything in the chamber was of gold and silver. After she had gone to bed and put out the light, someone came in and lay down beside her. This was the white bear, who cast off his bear-like shape at night, but she could never see him, for he always came after she had put out the light, and by daybreak he had always disappeared. For a while all went well, but then she took to sitting about still and sad. She was there alone all day and longed to be home with her parents and brothers and sisters. At last the white bear asked her what was the matter, and she answered that it was so lonely there. She was all by herself and longed to be home with her family. It was because she could not visit them that she felt so sad. I should be able to take you there, said the white bear, but you must promise me not to speak to your mother alone. Speak to her only when the others are listening nearby. For she is sure to take you by the hand, he said, and lead you into a chamber to talk with you alone. But you must never do it, otherwise you will make us both very unhappy. One Sunday the white bear said they could set off to see her parents. They started out and she sat upon his back. Their journey lasted a long, long time, and at last they came to a big white farmhouse. There were her brothers and sisters running about playing, and it was all so lovely there, and it was a joy to see. That is where your parents live, said the white bear. But you don't forget what I have told you, otherwise you will make me unhappy, and yourself too. And she swore she would not forget, and when she reached the house the white bear turned back and soon was gone. Her parents greeted her in all gladness. They scarcely knew how to express their thanks for all she had done for them. Now they were so well off, and they all asked her how she was getting on. She said she was very comfortable and had everything she could wish for. What else she told them it is hard to say, but I doubt whether they got very much out of her. Then in the afternoon, after they had eaten dinner, things happened just as the white bear had said. Her mother wished to speak to her alone, but she remembered what the white bear had told her and refused. What we have to speak of, she said, we can speak of here as well as anywhere. But in some way or other, her mother ended by persuading her, and she felt she had to tell her everything. She told her how someone always came in and lay down beside her after she put out a light at night, and she never saw him, because he had always disappeared by daybreak. And she was sad, for she wanted to see him so much, and during the day she was all by herself there, so deserted and lonely it was. Good gracious, you may well be sleeping with a troll, said her mother. But let me show you a way to see him. I can give you a candle end to hide in your bosom. Light it up and look at him while he is asleep, but take care not to let the tallow drip on him. And she took the candle and hid it in her bosom, and in the evening the white bear came and fetched her. After they had traveled some way, the white bear asked her whether things had turned out as he said they would. She had to confess that he was right. Well, if you have taken your mother's advice, you have made us both unhappy, and all is over between us, he said. But she said she had done no such thing. When she reached home and went to bed, the same thing happened again. Someone came in and lay down beside her. But in the course of the night, when she was sure he was asleep, she got up and lit the candle. She let it shine on him, and she saw that he was the most beautiful prince you could wish to look upon, and she fell so deeply in love with him that she felt she must die if she did not kiss him at once. She kissed him, but as she did, so she spilled three drops of hot tallow on his shirt and woke him.
What have you done? He cried. Now you have made both of us unhappy. If only you had been patient for a year, I should have been saved and freed from the spell. For I have a stepmother who has bewitched me, so that I am a white bear by day and a human creature by night. But now all is over between us. Now I must leave you and go to her. She lives in a castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon. And in the castle there is a princess with a nose two yards long. I shall have to wed her now. She wept and moaned, but it was no use. He had to leave her. And she asked if she could go with him. No, that was impossible. Tell me the way then, so I can try to find you. Can't I do that? Yes, she could try to search for him, but there was no way there. The castle was east of the sun and west of the moon, and she would never be able to find it. In the morning when she awoke, both the prince and the palace were gone. She lay in a tiny glade in the middle of a dense dark forest, and beside her was the same bundle of rags she had left home with. After she had rubbed the sleep out of her eyes and cried to her heart's content, she set out on her way. She walked for many days until she came to a high mountain. There sat an old woman playing with a golden apple. She asked the old woman whether she knew the way to the prince who lived with his stepmother in a castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon and who was to wed a princess with a nose two yards long. How do you come to know him? asked the old woman. Are you the one who is going to wed him? Yes, she said she was. Oh, you're the one, said the woman. All I know about him is that he lives in the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon, and you'll be there late or you'll be there never, but you can borrow my horse and ride to my neighbor. Maybe she can tell you where he is. And when you get to her, just slap the horse under the left ear and order it to go home again. And you can take this golden apple with you. She jumped up on the horse and rode a long, long way. At last she came to a mound where there sat an old woman winding yard in a golden reel. She asked the woman whether she knew the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon. And like the first woman, she said that she knew nothing except that it lay east of the sun and west of the moon. And you'll be there late or you'll be there never. But you can borrow my horse and ride to my nearest neighbor. Maybe she will know, and when you get to her, just slap the horse under the left ear and order it to go home again, she said. And she gave her the golden reel, saying it was sure to come in handy. The girl jumped on the horse and rode and rode again, ever so far, and at long last she reached a high mountain where sat an old woman turning a golden spindle, and she asked her whether she knew the way to the prince and where the castle was that lay east of the sun and west of the moon. And the same thing happened. Maybe it was you who was going to wed that prince, said the old woman. Yes, that was so. But she knew no more about the way than the other two. East of the sun and west of the moon, she knew it was. And you'll be there late or you'll be there never, she said. But you can borrow my horse. I think you better ride to the east wind and ask him. Maybe he knows of it and can blow you there. And when you get to him, you have only to slap the horse under the ear and it will go home again. And she gave her the golden spindle. It may come in handy, said the woman. She rode a long way for many days before she got there. But at last she came to the east wind. And she asked him whether he could tell her the way to the prince who lived east of the sun and west of the moon. Yes, the east wind said. He had heard of the prince and the castle too, but he did not know the way, for he had never blown as far as that. But if you like, I can take you to my brother, the west wind. Maybe he knows, for he is much stronger. You can sit upon my back and I shall carry you there. And she did so. And the wind blew strong, and when they got to the west wind, they went in, and the east wind said that he had brought with him a girl who was to have wed the prince who had lived in the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon. Now she was traveling in search of him, and he had carried her as far as this, and they wanted to inquire whether the west wind knew where the castle was. No, I have never blown that far, said the west wind, but if you like I could take you to the south wind, for he is much stronger than either of us, and he has roamed far and wide. Maybe he can tell you. You can sit on my back and I'll carry you there. She did so, and they rushed along to the south wind, and as far as I know it was a quick journey. When they arrived the west wind asked whether he could tell the girl the way to the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, for it was she who was supposed to wed the prince. Indeed, said the south wind, is she the one? Well, I've wandered about a bit in my time, he said, but I've never blown as far as that. But if you like I could take you to my brother, the north wind. He is the eldest and strongest of us all. And if he doesn't know where it is, you'll never find out anywhere. You can sit on my back and I'll carry you there. She sat on his back and off he went like an arrow, and the journey was soon over. When they approached the home of the north wind, he was so wild and unruly that a cold gust of air came at them from far, far off. What do you want? He whistled far away, sending an icy chill through them. Oh, you needn't be so severe, said the south wind. 
It's only me and this girl who was supposed to wed the prince that lives in the castle that lies east of the sun and west of the moon. And now she wants to ask you, have you been there? And can you tell her the way? She is anxious to find her prince again. Yes, I know where it is, said the north wind. Once upon a time I blew an aspen leaf there, but I was so tired afterwards that I couldn't blow it at all for days. But if you really want to go there, and if you aren't afraid of coming with me, I'll carry you on my back and see whether I can blow you as far as that. She said that she wanted to go there and had to go there. If only there was some kind of a way, and she was not afraid what they risked. Well, you had better stay the night here, said the north wind. We are sure to need at least a day if we are to complete our journey. Early next morning the north wind woke her, and he gathered all his strength and made himself so mighty and strong that it was terrible to see. Then off they sped high up in the air as if they were aiming to strike the end of the world in a second. There was such a storm in the countryside that woods and houses were blown down, and when they passed over the ocean hundreds of ships were wrecked, and they went on, flying far, far away, so far you would not believe it, out over the ocean until the north wind grew so spent and weary that he could not blow any more, and they sank down lower and lower, and at last they flew so low that the tops of the waves were lapping round their heels. Are you afraid? said the north wind. No, she said, she wasn't, but they were not far from the land now, and the north wind had just enough strength left to drop her off on the shore beneath the windows of the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon, and by then he was so tired and wretched that he had to rest for many days before he could fly home again. Next morning she sat down outside the castle windows and began playing with the golden apple, and the first person she saw was the nosy creature who was betrothed to the prince. What do you want for that golden apple of yours, she said, opening the window. It's not for sale, neither silver nor gold, said the girl. If it's not for sale for gold or for silver, what do you want for it? You can have whatever you like, said the princess. Well, if I could visit the prince who is here and spend this night with him, then I could let you have it, said she who had come with the north wind and it was settled she could do so. And the prince got the golden apple, but when the girl came up to the prince's room that night he was sound asleep. She called to him and shook him, and she wept and cried out to him, but she could not get him to wake. In the morning at the break of day the princess with the long nose came and sent her away again. During the day she sat outside the castle windows, winding yawn on her golden reel, and the same thing happened. The princess asked her what she wanted for it, and she said that it was for sale for neither silver nor gold, but that if she could have leave to spend the night with the prince, then the princess could have it. But when she came to join him, he was sound asleep again, and though she wept and shouted to him and shook him, he still slept on so deeply that she could not rouse him at all. And when day broke the next morning, the princess with the long nose came and sent her outside again. Later in the day, the girl sat under the castle windows, turning her golden spindle, and the princess with the long nose was eager to have that too. She opened the window and asked her what she wanted for it. The girl replied as she had done twice before, that it was for sale for neither silver nor gold, but that if she could visit the prince who was there and spend the night with him, then the princess could have it, and she was allowed to do so. But it so happened that there were some Christian folk who were captives there, and who were in the chamber next to where the prince was. They had heard a strange woman in his room crying and calling for him for two nights together, and they said so to the prince. And that night when the princess came with a hot drink for him, he pretended to drink it and poured it on one side, for now he realized it was a sleeping potion. When the girl came in this time, the prince was awake, and he made her tell him how she had found the way there. You've come just in time, said the prince. The wedding day is tomorrow, but I don't want to marry that nosy trollop, and you are the only one who can save me. I'm going to say that I want my bride to show me how skilled she is, and I'll ask her to wash the shirt with the three spots of tallow on it. She's sure to try, but she doesn't know that it was you who put them there. But this task can only be done by Christian folk, and not by a pack of trolls like these. And I'm going to say that I have no bride but the one who can do this task, and then I'll ask you. And great joy and delight was theirs that night. The day after, when it was time for the wedding, the prince said, First I'd like my bride to show me how skilled she is. Of course he could see her do anything at all, said the stepmother. I have a fine shirt that I wish to wear as my wedding shirt, but it has three spots of tallow on it, and I'd like them washed off. And I have sworn that I shall take no bride but the one who has the skill to do this task, and if my bride cannot do it, then she is not worth having. This sounded easy enough, and they were willing to try. The long-nosed princess began washing as best she could, but the more she rubbed the stains, the larger they grew. Oh, you can't wash shirts, said the old troll, her mother. Let me do it but she'd scarcely touch the shirt when it grew much dirtier, and the more she washed and rubbed the stains, the larger and darker they became, and the shirt got worse and worse. 
So the other trolls wanted to try to wash it, but the longer they kept at it, the dirtier and uglier it became, and in the end the whole shirt looked as if it had been dragged up a chimney. What a pack of good for nothing, said the prince. There is a beggar girl outside the window here. I'm sure she is much better at washing clothes than any of you. Come in here, my girl, he shouted, and in she came. Can you wash this shirt clean, he asked. Oh, I'm not sure, she said, but I'll see if I can. And no sooner had she touched the shirt and dipped it in water than it became as white as the driven snow and whiter still. You shall be my bride, said the prince. So then the old troll woman flew into such a rage that she burst, and the princess with the long nose and all the little trolls must have burst too, for I have heard nothing of them since. The prince and his bride set free all the good Christians who were captive there, and they took all the gold and silver they could carry, and moved far away from the castle that lay east of the sun and west of the moon.